I want to give a special shout out to all my patrons first. Thank you so much to my Biblio Spren, Biblio Howlers, and my Biblio Mansers. It means a lot to me that you give me your extra support for my passion and hobby. Hi everyone, uh, Patek here. Today's video will be my November wrap up. So I will be talking about all the books that I managed to finish uh, last month. And last month, I managed to finish uh, four novels, two short novels, one novella, one collection of short story, and also one narrative art book plus 14 volumes of manga. So yeah, quite a productive reading month. And on top of that, even though honestly, I have probably the worst reading month as far as reading quality goes, but I also managed to find the 11th five-star book out of every book that I read uh, this year so far, the 11th five-star book of the year 2023. And I think uh, if you have been following my channel, you will know what book that is. I will talk about that uh, later uh, in the video. But yeah, today's video will be about all the books that I finished last month. And let's start from the two short novels first. And these are uh, the two titles, the first two titles in Skyward Flight by Brandon Sanderson and also Gen Z Patterson. Uh, the first one is Sunridge and then the second one is Redon. Yeah. I've read only these two. I was planning to read Cytonic and also uh, the third and the final title in this collection of, uh, although it is marked as novella, I do not think these actually count as novellas because each of them actually exceed more than 50,000 words long. And well, that's already a short novel, no longer a novella because novella is below 50,000 words long. But yeah, I read Sunridge and if you have read Skyward and also uh, the second book, Starside, you might have realized that the original crew from the first book, the Skyward Flight, it, they were missing. They were missing most of the time in Starsight. And I know this is, well, kind of mixed received uh, by readers, even though Starsight is still very positively received uh, overall. I personally love Starsight more than Skyward after all, but, but I know that there are many readers and fans of the Skyward series that felt uh, Starsight should have included the crew of the Skyward Flight even more. And well, this is where you will get it. In Sunridge, you learn more about FM and also her relationship with Riggs. And you know, I don't actually mind their relationship, but this is for the first time in the series that it felt really like YA a sci-fi novel. The relationship development, how FM keeps on thinking about Riggs, and the way it is written, it really felt like reading a YA sci-fi novel. And for me, it is not in a good way because I am just so over reading relationships like this now in books. But I think the collaboration between Brandon Sanderson and also Jan C. Patterson works really well. If I did not know that Jan C. Patterson was actually involved in the writing process and the creation of these three titles, I would not be able to predict that Jan C. Patterson was actually in it. It really felt like Sanderson was writing it and this is just my assumption because if I'm not mistaken, Brandon Sanderson mentioned that he couldn't get the relationship between FM and Riggs correctly. That and also the voice of FM. But what I love most about Sunridge is, well, all the slugs. If you have read the Skyward series up to the Skyward flight, you will know the importance of the Doom Slug and all that. And I had a great time reading about them. They are easily the spotlight of Sunridge. So I gave Sunridge a 3.5 stars and I gave the same rating to the second title, uh, Redon. Redon did not felt like a YA book to me. It really felt like I was reading Skyward and Starside again, but this time it is from the perspective of a new character that appeared in Starside. And at this moment, I still think that it was a bit too late uh, to introduce this character as one of the main characters now, Alanik. But I can definitely understand and see why it is important to include her perspective in this collection of stories. I do not want to spoil anyone if you haven't read Starsight and also Skyward Flight yet, but yeah, Alanik is an important character in the entire Skyward series. But for me, the downside of reading Redon, even though it felt more important than uh, Sunridge, but the downside other than uh, Alanik being to be too late being introduced in the story, but I felt the narration of Alanik was, well, it did not feel too distinct. It really felt like I was reading FM's perspective again from the way it was written. I actually sometimes forgot that I'm reading from Alanik's perspective in Redon. But yeah, as I said, I had a good time reading a Redon overall, even though it took me a bit of a time, I think, to finish this one. It took me about three days. And yeah, I consider that a bit, uh, a bit too long because this one is only about 50,000 words so long. Usually I can get that done in a day, but not for this one. But because of reading Sunridge and also Redon, 
I end up having to put a Cytonic and also Evershore in the month of December. Yeah, I will read them uh, within this month. Hopefully Cytonic will be a better reading experience than what I expected because I heard so many mixed things about Cytonic and I will be studying uh, that book really soon. So I gave Sunrich and also Redon a 3.5 stars uh, rating each. For a short novel, they were good enough but they were nothing amazing. And for the next one, I'm going to be talking about this narrative art book that I received uh, last month. And I also finished it last month because this one is a short one. This is House of Poison by Michael Bartel and also illustrated by Gal Orr. If you have watched my book haul video, then you will see me uh, talking about this one. Michael Bartel, the author, was kind enough to send me a review copy of this one. And because the illustration inside this is done by Gal Orr, well, I decided to just take a read at a few pages and then I end up finishing <laughs> the entire book. It was really good, but I must say it is a typical coming of age and also revenge story in a historical fiction setting of Rome. But what made House of Poison stands out is easily uh, Gal Orr's illustration. The illustrations plus the narrative by Michael Bartel made House of Poison an incredibly engaging read. I did not feel bored reading it. Every page is filled with beautiful, beautiful illustrations like Hold on, I'm going to show one or two here. Like this one, this is uh, the beginning of part three, Nemesis. And every page, every new page you flip, it comes with the new illustrations. And yeah, it makes the pacing of the book better than I expected. And yeah, this one is a standalone tale. And I believe there is still a Kickstarter campaign going on for House of Poison right now. And you should check it out if you love reading a historical fiction standalone novel uh, with a setting in Rome and also a coming of age story and revenge uh, tale. At the very least, if you somehow end up disliking this book, well, the artwork inside this, I truly believe that you will love them all. Just like Sunridge and also Redon, I believe I give this one a 3.5 stars uh, rating as well. And moving on to the next one, the next book that I finished, it was Unbound by Michael Miller. This is the second book in the five book series of the Songs of Chaos. And this is a Dragon Rider epic fantasy. But if you come into Unbound expecting that this one will be a good replacement for Aragorn, I do not think that is a really good uh, comparison. But I am guilty of that myself because when I was reading uh, Ascendant, I keep on mentioning that Ascendant should be suitable to those of you who love reading Aragorn. And yeah, this is still a Dragon Rider epic fantasy tale. But you have to really uh, enjoy reading progression fantasy as well, especially once you reach Unbound. It is very important because there were a lot of sections in Unbound that revolves around a progression of fantasy. Training montage, diving deeper into the magic system, and also making sure the characters learn about the magics in details. Even in Cradle, one of my favorite progression fantasy series, in that series, I still feel like some of the progression fantasy aspect like the training montage touch and also how the character are so focused on seemingly only wanting to level up but without deeper characterizations these things kind of decrease my enjoyment of cradle especially in the first six books of the series and i have to say uh, in the first half of unbound i did felt that way as well i feel like i wanted more out of the characterizations and also relationship between ash and holt and also the other characters especially because ash and holt is easily the highlight of the Songs of Chaos series. And I did finally get what I wanted in the second half of Unbound, thankfully. But yeah, in the first half where the focus on the training montage and all that was really prominent, the pacing did not really click with me. But there is something special about Unbound and it is the inclusion of one new POV character named Osric. I think Michael Miller has done a great job and also a brilliant decision in including Osric as one of the main characters of the Songs of Chaos. Because here's the thing, as I said, I love Ash and Holt. They are a great pair and main characters. It is easy to like Ash and Holt, especially after reading Ascendant. But I also like having morally gray characters, and that's where Osric came in. I think having Osric as one of the POV characters give the series the dynamic and complexity, extra dynamic and complexity that the series needed. And by the end of Unbound, I am really curious to see where their story will go, both Ash and also Osric. But for Talia, one of the other POV characters, because unlike Ascendant, where most of the storyline is told only through the perspective of Holt, this one has three POV characters, and one of them is a supporting character in the first book, Talia. But Talia's story in this one did not really work with me. I think the politicking did not feel too engaging. 
which is unfortunate, but again, for Talia, I would have preferred to read more of her relationship with the dragon instead of the politic of the human politics uh, in the world. But yeah, I think Unbound is still a great book, even though I love Ascendant more, but this one is still, well, it felt like a necessary foothold for the rest of the series to shine, and I have a good feeling that Defiant will become the best in the series so far. Unfortunately, uh, I cannot get around to Defiant uh, within this month, so I think I will read that in the month of January or February, hopefully anyway. And other than Unbound, I also read two more fantasy books, and well, one is a hit, and one is a, unfortunately one of the biggest disappointments of the year uh, for me. So I think, I guess I will start with the bad one first, and it is, I think at the moment, this is still a very unpopular opinion, and this is A War to End All by Michael R. Fletcher and also a Clayton Schneider. This is the third and the final book in the Manifest Delusion series, and I kind of feel like a jerk right now because I requested for a copy, or for a review copy of A War to End All. This is one of my favorite grimdark fantasy series, and even though I felt disappointed with this conclusion, I still consider it one of my favorite grimdark fantasy because Beyond Redemption, The Mirror's Truth, especially The Mirror's Truth, and also the standalone spin-off, uh, Swarm and Steel, they are all brilliant grimdark fantasy with great concepts and also disgusting and abhorrent characters, but you cannot help but root for them. But for A War to End All, it's just not what I wanted and not what I expected, not in a good way anyway, because from the title, it is called A War to End All. And then you see the cover art by Andrew Maleski, absolutely gorgeous, stunning, and it depicted like this massive darkness and brutality in the cover art, just like the series. But what I read was not any of that. A War to End All felt like a long epilogue to the mirror's truth, and one of the biggest strengths of Manifest Delusion, uh, for me anyway, lies in the main characters, in the main trio, Bad Edge, Witch Tech, and also Stellan. So the authors, uh, Michael Fletcher and also Snyder, decided to sideline the main characters of Beyond Redemption and also the mirror's truth. Generally speaking, every time this happened, I always, always felt disappointed by the ending. Like for example, Queen of Fire by Anthony Ryan. I was massively disappointed by that. Or The Fall of Babel by Josiah Bancroft. Both of these books, and also A War to End All, did the same thing. The main characters from the previous books are sidelined into becoming supporting or sometimes even non-existent characters. Well, close to non-existent anyway, in my opinion, because they were the spotlights of the previous books, and in the final book, they end up becoming, well, the supporting character. Most of the time, I do not like that, because I have read their stories, I have read their development from the first book, and I want to read more of them. I want to get a satisfying closure for their characters in the final book. And in a way, I guess I did get that with Witch Tick and Bad Edge, of course, if you have read Manifest Delusion up to this one. But Stalin, I think the resolution of her story, it was very forgettable. I actually don't remember what happened to her now. And as I said, it was a struggle every time I read uh, the perspective of other characters that are not Stalin and also Witch Tick here, which is a bit surprising to me because in the previous books, uh, Konik and also Morgan, they were pivotal to the entire narrative and they felt more engaging than what happen in uh, a war to end all. I think uh, for me, the decision to include so many doppels, new doppels in this book did not work with me. So yeah, unfortunately, a war to end all was a big disappointment for me. And again, I have to apologize to Michael Fletcher and also Clayton Snyder, but I have to always be honest with my review and this is my honest thoughts. Very important point to mention, once again, this is just my opinion, there is always a chance you will end up liking A War to End All much more than I did. Fortunately, I did have a great time reading the other fantasy book and I just did a spoiler free review of this one on my YouTube channel and it is The Tainted Cup by Robert Jackson Bennett. This is the first book in a new series titled The Shadow of the Leviathan and it is a murder mystery in a high fantasy setting. I think many have mentioned that if you love Sherlock Holmes, you love Knives Out, there is a good chance you will love reading uh, The Tainted Cup. And I think it is true. 
but there is something to remember. This one is also suitable if you love reading the setting in Attack on Titan. I've talked about this in more details in my spoiler review of the Tainted Cup, so I will try to keep this one briefer. But Robert Jackson Bennett has always been one of my favorite authors. I think he blends fantasy, sci-fi, horror, and now mystery very seamlessly in a fantasy setting uh, in his books. And I love that. I love reading all of that, and I feel for his talent and also his storytelling skill, he is still very underrated in the fantasy and sci-fi landscape in comparison to many other big fantasy authors. Uh, anyway, as a fan of the Divine City trilogy and also the Founders trilogy, I was so looking forward to reading The Tainted Cup and this one is still not published. This one will be published in about two months from now in the first week of February and I believe it will be super worth to wait. To put it simply, I call this one a Knives Out or Sherlock Holmes in an Attack on Titan inspired setting. I have no idea whether it is intentional or not, but well, that's the first thing that came to my mind when I first read about the world of the shadow of the Leviathan. And Robert Jackson Bennett mentioned at the end of the book that he had so much fun writing murder mystery and he will write more. So I think there's a good chance, assuming that the sales do well, there's a really good chance we will have a lot of books in the shadow of the Leviathan series. And I will be grateful for that because I think this one is another hit from Robert Jackson Bennett and many people who love reading murder mystery and also high fantasy will have a great time reading this one. For the last three titles I read in the month of November, these are all part of the same series. And yeah, if you have been following my channel, you will know which series this is. This is uh, the Sun Eater series by Christopher Rocchio. So I read one novella, one collection of short stories, and also one novel in the Sun Eater series within this one month. And yeah, as you can tell, I've been a bit obsessive about Sun Eater lately ever since I read Empire of Silence uh, two months ago. So I will start from the novella first. I read Queen Amid Ashes by Christopher Rocchio. This is the second main novella in the Sun Eater series and this should be read after you finish reading Howling Dark and that's what I did. I love uh, Queen Amid Ashes more than the first novella, uh, The Lesser Devil. but. Both novellas are really good in my opinion. And if you love the Sun Eater series by Christopher Rocchio, I think you must try reading uh, these two uh, novellas as well. Although the first one, The Lesser Devil, also count as short novel. But Queen of the Ashes definitely count as novella as it is about 30,000 words long. But yeah, the story in Queen of the Ashes do take place after Howling Dark and it dives deep into the meaning of monstrosity. We have always known that Selsin is the main villain of the Sun Eater series, but are they the bigger monster compared to humanity? This is the biggest question asked in Queen Amid Ashes. Which one is more monstrous or evil, humanity or the Selsin? And I had such a great time reading Queen Amid Ashes because in The Lesser Devil, the story is told from the perspective of Hadrian's brother Crispin. But in Queen Amid Ashes, we are back once again in Hadrian's narration. And not gonna lie, the entire novella really felt like some chapters taken out of the main novels in the Sun Eater series. It really felt like we're back reading the main installment in the Sun Eater again. And of course, I would not complain about that. Hadrian's narration is just so distinct and unforgettable uh, for me. So yeah, I had a great time reading Queen Amid Ashes. And yes, if you have read the series up to Howling Dark, once again, you must read this novella. And then, before I dive into, of course, Demon in White, I also read Tales of the Sun Eater, Volume 1. This is the collection of short stories in the, in the Sun Eater series. And unfortunately, my experience for this one is really mixed. I like about three titles in this collection, but overall, I do not think they are necessary to read. Other than Demons of Arai and the other two titles with Hadrian in them, I do not think any of the other titles in the collection of short stories, I think consists of seven short stories, I do not think any of them are really a must read. This is really not Christopher Rocchio's fault, he is a great storyteller, amazing storyteller, but he is at his best when he's writing full novels. And short stories generally really does not click with me, unless of course it is written by Ken Lee but not every author can be as good as writing short story like Ken Lee. So yeah, Tales of the Sun Eater Volume 1 was a bit disappointing, but fortunately, the last book that I will be talking about today and also the best book of the month, one of the best sci-fi book uh, of all time, really. And it is, of course, the third novel in the Sun Eater series, Demon in White. At the time of recording uh, this video, I am still at a loss on how to actually review this masterpiece. And usually, 
I prefer writing and also creating a review first for a book before I talk about them in my monthly wrap up video. But for this one, this is something truly special. It is a sci-fi masterpiece and I just want to come up with a review that can satisfy and also do this book justice. And because of that, I'm gonna need some time before I post a full review of Demon in White, hopefully uh, within next week. But I think those who have read Demon in White will know the struggle of actually reviewing this masterpiece because when I read a book, usually I can choose which one is my favorite sequence, one or two favorite sequence from the book. But I cannot do that in Demon in White. Even though there were no parts division in the Demon in White, but it felt like five books being melded into one efficiently and effectively and I am in love with every part of Demon in White. It is absolutely incredible. And for now, before I post my full review, I would just say that this is probably one of the top three best sci-fi book that I have ever read. Actually, scratch that. It is actually one of the top three best sci-fi book that I have ever read. And it might just become my favorite sci-fi book of all time. But I will try to let the recency bias sink in a little bit before deciding that. But yeah, this is amazing just amazing well done christopher rocchio and of course this is my book of the month this is the only book just like last month the only book to receive a five out of five stars rating actually five out of five stars isn't enough i will actually give this a six out of five stars if i could but yeah for the sake of the record on goodreads yes this is the only five stars book i gave in the month of november absolutely incredible well done to christopher rocchio and i believe this is the best book in the series so far and as i said i will try to post my full spoiler review of demon in white uh, next week so that's it for all the books that i finished uh, last month. As I said, I read 14 volumes of manga and 12 of these are actually a reread of Attack on Titan. Now that I'm done with watching Attack on Titan to the end again because I have witnessed the end of Attack on Titan for the first time uh, using the manga and now it is through the anime, well, I miss the world and I want to experience Attack on Titan from the beginning again with all the knowledge that I have attained from experiencing the entire story. And well, let's just say that I think Hajime Isayama is really a genius. The foreshadowing that he put from the beginning of the series is just insane. But as spotting all of them again now is just so satisfying. And I look forward to finding out how I will feel by the end of the series again. <laughs> so yeah, I did read volume 3 up to volume 10 and I also read the spin-off manga about Levi and his background story. And that's uh, Attack on Titan, no regrets. Love them too, but again, as I always say, I think when it comes to Attack on Titan, I think the anime is just superior. As for the other two manga volumes that I managed to finish, it was uh, the two volumes in Black Clover. Oh wait, come to think about it, I guess that makes this 12 volumes, not 14 volumes of manga in total. But yeah, for Black Clover Volume 6 and Volume 7, uh, they were a bit alright. I don't have a lot of comments on them, but this is definitely your typical standard shonen manga and I hope now that I have read seven volumes of it, I hope that the series will start to pick up its pace and also turn into something better really soon because otherwise I might end up uh, DNFing the manga series. So yeah, I think that's pretty much it. That's my November wrap up and as I said in the beginning of this video, my December wrap up will be posted uh, in January. So this is my last wrap up video of the year. Once again, my favorite book of the month, just like last month and the previous month, is again another book in the Sun Eater series. And this time it is the best of the series so far, Demon in White. And yeah, I will post my full review of Demon in White as soon as I can, hopefully within next week. But do tell me uh, how many books you finished in the month of November and which one was your favorite book uh, of the month. I guess that's pretty much it for me today. As always, thank you so much for watching and thank you for your support. Bye-bye. Lastly, I want to say thank you so much once again to all my patrons who keep on supporting me.